Nothing in Tivland is so illusory as Tav. There is no reality in it, whatever, nor in any of the ideas associated with it. Yet it is of all things the one in which every thief places the most implicit belief. From the time when a child begins to understand what is said, he listens to people around him talking about the Mbatav. He is continually hearing about them till he himself is old enough to talk and starts to go about to other children, speaking to them of the Mbatav in the way that he has heard from his elders. So it has come about that this thing lies at the very root of the thief's life and is bound up with all his activities. Fear of the Mbatav has taken hold on the people like a persistent and incurable disease. Even those who have been educated and have traveled abroad too have not learned enough to show them that Tav is nothing. Because all their thoughts and all their learning are on the surface and cannot teach them the difference between what is black and what is white. It gives them a knowledge of material things but does not penetrate to their immortal souls. I, Akiga, who today no longer believe in Tav, have come to this only through the mercy and power of God the giver of life. Otherwise, there would today be no more fervent believer in Tav than I, nor any in Tivlan whose beliefs were more debased than mine. So it is that the man who stands close to the house cannot see in what manner the roof is crooked. It is only when he goes back and stands some distance away from it that he gets a true view and can tell the builders how to set it straight. According to the Tiv, Tav has actually material existence and is a thing which can be seen and touched. The place where it is found is in the man's heart and it can also sometimes be seen in animals, both domestic and wild. In appearance, it is like the liver, but it's also not broad or so thick. In man, it is of two kinds. In some, it is large and its edge is finely notched. This is the bad kind the tav of killing men and eating human flesh. In others, though it may be big, its edge are not notched but rounded. This is the good kind, the kind for protecting the land. It is not the tav of eating men, but the tav of wisdom. As to its exact position, it is attached to the base of the heart. During youth, it is quite short, but separates off when a boy grows up. In some cases, it becomes detached while the child is still young. In the days before the white man came, if a man died, the members of his age grade cut open his chest and examined his internal organs. If he had a serrated type of tav, they said he had brought about his own death. For with this kind of tav, he would not fail to be an eater of men. But if when they opened him up and found only the round type of tav, they said he had been killed out of malice and that they would not let the matter rest. So they went to the diviner and having learnt who it was that had killed their age mate, they called together all the members of their greed and subjected the man to the Hoyo. The knife which had been used in cutting open the body of the dead man was stuck into a tree by the side of a path along with many people would pass. Everyone who saw it expressed his approval. So and so belonged to a fine age greed, they said. His death is not being left to go unavenged. His age mates have cut him open to examine him, and though he is dead, they are fighting his battles. Many are the stories told by the thief about the Mbatav, some of which are recorded below. They are all figments of the imagination, and there is not a particle of truth in any of them. If a thief tells you all these things, and you ask him if he is Tav himself, he will deny it. There is not a man in thief who will honestly admit to it. If he professes that he is Tav, it is for one of two reasons. Either he is lying and says that he is Tav in order that men may respect and fear him, for they say that the word of a man who is not Tav carries no weight and is disregarded as being of no importance. Or else he admits it of necessity. That is to say, no one will believe him when he denies that he is Tav and is therefore compelled to suffer the name against his will. That the doctrine of Tav is a myth which men are forced to accept whether they wish it or not, I know very well from my own experience. Many years ago, when I lived in close companionship with my father, Sai, 
All my group said I was Tav, but there was never any truth in it. My reputation for Tav was acquired in this way. My mother left me when I was a child, and my life was a very hard one. But my father took great care of me and did all he could to find means to feed me. For this reason, he used to perform the rite of the Akombo of the crops and the farm of his chief wife, the daughter of Turan, called El. The Akombo was in the field at the foot of a shear tree, and Iande had been planted round it. Whenever the time came to perform the rites, my father woke me at cock crow before it was light, caught a cock and gave it to Hilekan, his elder son, to carry, filled the guard with water for me to take, and he himself carried the fire. Then we went out of the farm. My father carried out the Akombo rites, we killed and ate the chicken, and returned to the village in the early morning. Seeing this, people said Hilekan and Akiga are tav beyond all measure. There is no one in these parts to be compared with them. They are eating human flesh with their father. But for my part, I knew that it was not so. My father was only seeking an opportunity to give me something to eat. Yet, when I heard that people interpreted the affair in this way, and that it seemed to them the work of Mbatav, I was not content to let the matter rest there, but did everything I could to play up my reputation for Tav in order to attract attention to myself and make people afraid of me. There was another incident. An agent of the firm of John Holt at Ibi gave my father a large iron box. This was very highly prized for the time iron boxes in Tivland were rare. The key was kept by Hile Khan, and he alone used to open the box. No one else touched it. At the time when the daughter of Buria, one of my father's chief wives, was being brought home as a bride and the marriage dance was in progress, I went into the house of the daughter of Adamu, where the box was kept, this being also the house into which the bride had been taken. I sat down on a bed on which were several boxes, including the iron box in question, and began to play about with it for amusement. While I was engaged in this, I noticed that the iron hasp into which the padlock fits was raised, by which I knew that it was unlocked. So I went out and told my father that Ilekan had opened the box and had forgotten to lock it again. My father asked me how I knew this, and I told him that I saw the hasp was pointing upwards. So he called Hilekan and questioned him. Hilekan replied that he had locked it quite securely, and that I had opened it by Tav. Thereupon, my father seized hold of me, and undoing the girdles round his waist, set about beating me. To everyone who came to stop him, he said, No, leave me alone. Akiga's Tav has passed all bounds. Look at my iron box that he had opened by Tav in order to see the Ibrovungu inside. When the other heard this, he was seized with fear and backed away, saying, Beat him. If so small a child has this much Tav in him, what will he not do with it when he grows up? My father beat me till my body was covered with sores. In the end, I broke loose from him and ran away and hid. But for the love which he had for me, he sought me out, and when he had found me in the house of the daughter of Azandi, he took me in his arms and soothed me. The next morning, my name was in everyone's mouth. They all spoke of my tav, and many things were invented to add to the story. Some said that yesterday I had opened the box and put my head and shoulders inside so that the sweat poured from me. Others said I had taken out the Ibrovungu and was looking at it, when Hilekan found me and went to tell Sai, who came and caught me with it in my hand and beat me. With this sort of tav, they said, Akiga, when he grows up, will surpass Hilekan. When I realized that everyone admired me for my tav, I was much flattered and began to tell people all sorts of lies about the Mbatav. In this, moreover, I was never contradicted. They said I was so full of tav that anything I said about the Mbatav ought not to be doubted. I was delighted at this and thenceforth set my whole heart on Tav so that people came to marvel at me and I was only a very small boy. There was another reason why people called me Tav. In those days when I was still a child, I used to follow my father about like his shadow. Day and night, I never left him. Only when he went on a long journey did we part company. So it happened that being always with him, I had the chance to see and hear much. For he was a man of high standing and the head of his group. Now he had many wives, and in the house of whichever wife he was spending the night, I would sleep too. 
and if in the night I felt the need to relieve nature, I went outside to do it. I was never afraid of darkness like other children. Moreover, it was a case of necessity. I was afraid to make water in the house, lest if I did so, the wife to whom it belonged would rate my father on the morrow of having brought me to make a mess in her house, and when she came to cook the meal, she would refuse to give me any. One night, when I had gone out according to my usual custom, I saw two little black pigs which scampered away from me, one this way and one that. Now there were two people who owned pigs in our village, Akure, my father's sister, and Gata, his wife. And as each of their pigs had litters, I concluded that the young pigs belonged to them. When I went back into the house, my father was awake, so I told him about it. When I went out just now, I said, I saw two little black pigs. I wonder who has left his pig out like this for a hyena to take. My father asked me whether they were both black or whether one was not white, and I answered in the darkness they had seemed to me to be black. The next morning, he told Hilekan. Hilekan called me and asked me what I saw when I went out in the night, and I told him that I had seen two little black pigs. When I said this, Hilekan answered angrily that I was to stop lying and tell him exactly what happened, otherwise he would give me a thrashing. Even so, I did not first understand what he wished to hear, and so when he asked me again, I repeated exactly what I had told him in the first time. Thereupon, he picked up a stick to beat me for not telling him the truth. I had not the least idea what to do, and the thoughts passed quickly through my mind. I have told the truth, and Hilekan is not satisfied. I will tell him a lie and see whether perhaps he will believe it. So I turned round the story as though it were the work of the Mbatav. I will tell you the truth, I said. What I saw last night were the owls of the Mbatav, there were two of them, and they had indigo clothes wrapped around their bodies. When I came out, they scuttled away along the ground, flapping their wings. Hilekan said, Ah, now you have told me the truth. When the story got round, my reputation for Tsav was much enhanced. Last night, they said, the Mbatsav appeared in Sai's village, and Akiga came out and drove them off. For many days, people talked about nothing else. Koho, a kinsman of my father, gave me the name of Ikenpe, a name connected with Mbatav, which means a pepper that is different from all other peppers. That is to say, the Mbatav were hot as red pepper, but I was hotter than they, and had driven them off. The people at my home still remember this name, but I do not like to be called by it now.